Hello, and welcome to Why Communities of Color Should Care About Social Security Reform. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Anand Subramanian, and I'm the Program Manager for the Closing the Racial Wealth Gap Initiative at the Insight Center for Community Economic Development. Today's program is scheduled to last for one hour. There will be a moderated discussion with panelists, followed by a question and answer session. Participant lines will be muted during the broadcast, so please submit all questions via the questions chat box in your control panel. You can access your control panel by clicking on the little white arrow in the orange box. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation. Your participation is critical to the success of this event. First, I'd like to introduce Ann Price, director of the Closing the Racial Wealth Gap Initiative, who will say a few words about the initiative and introduce our moderator. Thank you, Anand. We are so pleased to be hosting this important webinar on why communities of color should care about Social Security reform. The issue of income inequality has dominated the news in recent weeks, but there is also another long-standing cleft in our society, racial wealth disparity. For every dollar of wealth owned by a typical white family, the typical family of color owns only about a nickel, which is down from about 13 cents before the recession. The Closing the Racial Wealth Gap Initiative here at Insight is a national effort to build awareness and support for efforts to address racial and ethnic wealth inequalities. To achieve this goal, we have brought together over 170 scholars, advocates, and other experts of color to inform national economic debates with diverse perspectives and to develop universal and targeted policy solutions to assure economic inclusion. With that overview, let's get started. I am so pleased to introduce Maya Rocky Moore, a noted speaker, author, and media commentator who will serve as the moderator for today's webinar. Maya is president and CEO of Global Policy Solutions and one of the principal authors of the report, Plan for a New Future, the Impact of Social Security Reform on People of Color. Maya, we have heard so much in the news about proposals to gut Social Security based on claims that it is broke and that it will take a number of drastic measures to fix it. And this is not the first time we've heard myths and misleading language about Social Security. Before I turn the discussion over to you, Maya, can you talk a little bit about why communities of color should care about the current debate that's taking place around Social Security and what is really at stake for our community? Sure, Anne, I'd be happy to. Well, Social Security has existed for about seven, 77 years and it has helped to provide economic security for American workers and their families. For families of color, Social Security has not only helped to keep them out of poverty, it's also helped them to maintain a standard of living that wouldn't otherwise be possible when they or their family members are faced with death, disability, or old age. So it's important to note that women of color are especially reliant on Social Security. In general, women live longer than men, have a history of lower earnings during the course of their working years. They take time, more time out of the workforce to help care for family members or children, and they have higher rates of poverty. All of these factors increase their reliance on Social Security. So as you've already expressed, Anne, uh, people of color are already economically disadvantaged by policies and practices that are rooted in historical discrimination. Yet today, men, women, and children of color have been further devastated by disproportionate rates of unemployment, foreclosures, and poverty generated by the twin housing and financial crises. Given the combined effect of all of these factors, and it is assured that communities of color will continue to be heavily reliant on Social Security well into the future. Unfortunately, despite the need for strengthening Social Security and ensuring that its benefits are adequate for future generations, there are powerful voices in our society who are saying that we need to reduce Social Security benefits or privatize the program altogether. So whether it's promoting private accounts managed by Wall Street or falsely asserting that Social Security is going bankrupt, or making spurious arguments about the impact of Social Security on annual deficits and the national debt, these powerful voices shift their arguments depending on the context of the debate. But their underlying intent remains the same, to undermine the Social Security program. We cannot afford to have these voices prevail. As people of color transition into becoming the majority 
of the U.S. workforce and eventually the majority of the older adult population, it's important for the nation to consider how these populations use Social Security and how the program can be modernized to meet the needs of an increasingly diverse and economically insecure 21st century workforce. In recognition of Social Security's continued relevance for a new generation of diverse Americans, the Insight Center for Community Economic Development and Global Policy Solutions convened the Commission to Modernize Social Security in 2011. Comprised of leading experts from or representing African American, Asian American, and Pacific Islander, Latino, and Native American communities, the Commission was given the specific task of identifying proposals to extend Social Security's long-term solvency while also modernizing the program to ensure that it continues to achieve its goal of increasing economic security for all people. Today, members of the Commission to Modernize Social Security and others will share their expertise and recommendations about these issues from the recent report, Plan for a New Future, the Impact of Social Security Reform on Communities of Color. I am pleased to introduce to you today and to be joined by my colleagues, Dave Baldrige, the Executive Director of the International Association for Indigenous Aging, Wilhelmina Lay, Senior Research Associate at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, Meiju Louie, Director Emeritus of the Closing the Racial Wealth Gap Initiative, and Roy Aragon, Public Affairs Specialist at the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. In the interest of time, you can certainly read their bios on the Insight Center for Community and Economic Development's website, and you can view that on your screen, expertsofcolor.org, for more information. So uh, I think I'll start out by throwing out a question to Wilhelmina. Uh, Wilhelmina, what is the state, can you describe for our listening audience, what is the state of the retirement, uh, retirement and income security in America for vulnerable populations in general? And what role does Social Security play? Wilhelmina? Okay. As, as you can see from the very first slide, um, elderly populations have a high rate of poverty. This means that once they reach the age of 65, and many of them are no, are no longer working, um, about one in every five Latinos and African Americans are poor. The rates are even slightly higher among women. Next slide. Next slide. Um, now, why is this so? Historically, we have talked about a three-legged stool of retirement income. And that stool had the following legs. It had a pension, social security, and private personal savings. Over time, as the pension has become less common within the employer benefit package and it has been re replaced by a defined contribution benefit plan that you basically get back from what you have paid in, uh, we're finding that this three-legged stool has almost morphed into a two-legged stool, one of which is social security, the other of which is personal savings. Now this slide shows that if we have to base our well-being during our retirement years on our personal savings, that all workers aren't doing terribly well because about half of all workers have saved $25,000 or less. 70% um, of African American workers and 72% of Hispanic workers have saved that amount. So you can see at a glance that personal savings is not going to uh, support all of us when we are no longer working. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So now we're down to two legs from three, and the other leg is Social Security. From, from this slide, you can see at a glance that people of color and all people uh, use the Social Security as a strong base for their support, especially when they're age 55 or older, as this graph represents. You can see that among white, 
one in every five uh, has Social Security as their only source of income, and that percentage soars to 44% of Hispanics, 40% uh, of African Americans, and 29% of Asians. Next slide. Now, so far, I've said that we had a three-legged stool at one point. We're now down to two legs, one of which is personal savings. We're not doing that well with personal savings. Uh, the other is social security, and you can see that many of us depend on that for our only source of income. This slide shows, okay, if we are depending on social security as our only source of income, how much income do we have in a given year? And based on the numbers on that slide, you can see that average monthly benefits are around $1,000 or so, um, because these are annual benefits. And that is not enough to live on. So in short, the um, situation for people of color who are retired or no longer in the workforce depends heavily on social security, and it also means that that system has to step up to the plate and offer benefits that are more generous and allow people to live with dignity. Thank you, Wilhelmina. I think that uh, you've made it clear that uh, this, the three-legged stool is now a two-legged stool, which means that it's more likely to fall, right? Correct. So, with that, um, I think that every community of color has different issues when it comes to Social Security, different perspectives, different demographic trends influencing how this program works with their communities or for their communities. So I'd like to start with Roy, uh, but then turn it over to Dave, uh, Wilhelmina, and Meju to talk about the importance of Social Security to your specific community. What features are particularly helpful, Roy, to the Latino community? Okay, there are several features that we would need to look at, and the first one being that uh, Social Security is a family-oriented benefit. Uh, Latinos, on the average, have between three and four children as compared to maybe two, 2.5 or something like that for the rest of the uh, society. So it becomes very important uh, as a family benefit. Uh, because usually there are more beneficiaries. It means a larger benefit uh, for the Latino families. Usually Latinos will earn less in their career, so they have less of an opportunity to invest, and they can save less as well. Usually the jobs that they work in, that the Latinos work in, uh, do not provide a pension. So again, more relying, uh, relying on Social Security to a greater degree. There's also a more, a more incidence of disability among Latinos for a couple reasons. One being that uh, we are prone to a lot of chronic illnesses such as uh, diabetes, heart conditions, and so, and so on. Uh, there's also more risk at the work because normally the jobs that Latinos do are menial jobs, uh, more labor intensive, more risky, uh, risk of, of uh, injury is great. So Social Security, again, uh, Latinos depend on Social Security for a greater portion of their retirement income. We see that uh, three quarters of the Latinos rely on Social Security for one half of their retirement income. 53% rely, rely on Social Security for 90% of their retirement income. And fully about 44, 45% rely on Social Security for 100% of their retirement income. Poverty rates are also higher for Latinos. Uh, we see that uh, without Social Security, I mean with Social Security, I'm sorry, compare with Social Security, Latinos face a poverty rate of 20 percent. Without Social Security, that uh, poverty rate would go up to 50, a little over 50, almost 51 percent. Uh, further, the progressive formula helps people with lower income. In other words, the lower that your income is, the greater percentage of your average earnings are replaced by Social Security. It's a progressive formula. Uh, typically, somebody that has high earnings might get around 25 percent 
return every month, Latinos stand to get around 40, between 40 and 45 percent. So it becomes uh, important because we live longer as well. We live as much, once we get to be 65, we live as much as four years longer than most of the rest of the population. So again, we depend on those social security benefits for a longer time. We depend on them for a larger proportion of our retirement income. Thank you. Uh, Dave, what about Native Americans? Can you share how, the, how, how important social security is to your population? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, I need to point again to the extreme poverty that exists on America's 334 Indian reservations. About 700,000 people live on those reservations, but these include some of the lowest per capita income counties in the nation. 36% um, of families with children on reservations are below the poverty line compared to 9.2% of families nationally. That's four times the level of poverty for families with children. Um, extreme poverty rates, meaning less than $3,000 a year, on the 10 largest reservations in the U.S. Um, are as much as six times the national average. So, Wilhelmina, I, I guess I'd have to say that the, the huge stressor for us is that we have a one-legged stool in many cases for our elders. Uh, we don't have opportunities, they don't have opportunities for personal savings, for retirement, or for retirement accounts. So the benefits as they exist, given like Roy's, uh, Roy's conversation, given our high rates of disability, the, the difficult, dangerous jobs that, that many reservation employees have to undertake, if we could maintain benefits as they are without uh, without losing ground on the cost of living allowance, without losing ground on the age of eligibility, it would be greatly welcome across Indian country. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I think that we've pretty much heard that uh, the two-legged stool is now one-legged stool. Uh, and so I don't even know if we can call it a stool in that context. Well, Amina, can you uh, actually share with us how uh, Social Security serves the African-American population? Yes. Um, African-Americans um, are likely to use different types of program benefits and different sub subgroups uh, are likely to get these benefits. And I'll start by walking through this particular slide. Um, as you can see from the slide, we are less likely to get retirement benefits. We are more likely to get disability benefits and more likely to get survivor benefits than our whites. There's a very similar pattern, though, uh, with, with the groups that are uh, described here as other, which includes uh, Hispanics, Asians, and uh, Pacific Islanders. Um, but one of the key pieces here is that, yes, we are more likely to get disability and sur survivor benefits, but some of the people, many of the people who are getting those benefits are children. Uh, one of every five children who receives Social Security benefits is African American. That's 20 percent. So African American children are only 15 percent of all children in the U.S. Similarly, a larger share of b blacks who get survivor benefits are children uh, than among other groups. More, about half of the beneficiaries who are African American and getting survivor benefits are children. That's more than double the 23 percent that white children represent among sur survivor beneficiaries. Now, clearly, the math says that if we're more likely to get disability and survivor benefits and less likely to get retirement benefits, there must be some reason for that. Next slide. Next slide, please. 
And, and the next slide shows part of that reason. African Americans are less likely than other groups to get retirement benefits in large part because of our lower life expectancy. And you can see from the data there at a glance that if you're African American and male, you have the lowest life expectancy on this particular chart that has just black and white. Um, and therefore, discussions about raising the retirement age are not likely to benefit members of these groups very, very much, either the black males or the black females. And that's it. Thank you, Wilhelmina. Meiju, Asian American populations are also heavily reliant on Social Security. Can you share with us more about the importance of the program to Asians? I certainly can. I would first note that people probably know that within 30 years, the majority of our population in the United States will be not white. And Asians will double in, in size during that period of time, as will, um, as will Latinos. So it's very important that data be collected for this group, and it is not right now. So you might have noticed in some of the slides, we don't have Asian or uh, American Indian um, pop uh, population data, which is extremely important. So we hope that that will be collected in the future, and we'll certainly advocate for that. Um, but when you do disaggregate the data uh, among Asian Pacific Americans, you see a great deal of differences. For example, Chinese and South Asians have higher wages and incomes. Therefore, they would collect slightly higher benefits when they retire. Southeast Asians and Pacific Islanders are among the lowest earners. In fact, the Hmong are the highest poverty ethnicity in the United States. So again, we need that disaggregated data among populations. Contrary to popular opinion, Asian Americans are not doing better than whites. That's kind of a, a myth out there right now. Um, in fact, Social Security keeps one in five Asian Pacific American elders out of poverty. But I did want to emphasize um, the immigrant data because so much of our population is um, foreign born. Over two thirds of Asians are born in another country. And for those reasons, they have shorter work histories and perhaps are in jobs with lower pay because of language difficulties and so on, and don't bring assets with them. Um, but in families that do have Social Security benefits, it makes a life-saving difference so that you can see in this uh, slide that for uh, legal documented immigrants who are eligible for Social Security, um, half families don't have any Social Security benefits, and that's why you see the zero in the Asian uh, column there for documented immigrants. So for those who are eligible, who do get the benefits, um, they get $12,000, which is obviously enormous, uh, uh, makes an enormous difference. And even for the naturalized citizens, you see a difference between $12,000 and $15,500, which again, it's, it's like a third more if they have Social Security. So again, even though it's a hugely immigrant population, Social Security is extremely important. Um, and just to make uh, just a couple of other points, because Asians also, like Latinos, live longer than other races. An adequate cost of living um, increase is, is really critical uh, for those who live over the age of 85. They have very few supports. Their costs actually go up. And so if we were to cut COLA benefits, which is uh, something that has been suggested, it would be devastating for these very elderly um, people in our populations. And just one um, last thing is that for all of these populations, including um, Asians and Pacific Islanders, because there are so many in low wages, um, just the benefits really need to be improved overall. Uh, as you all know, the, the official poverty rate is, rate is too low anyway, so just increasing benefits in general is something that we need. Thank you, Meiju. I think that everybody's clearly articulated why Social Security is important for all Americans, uh, and particularly important for communities of color. Uh, however, we keep hearing in the media that Social Security is going broke. Roy, uh, what's behind that? Uh, is Social Security going broke? No, that's a myth that's uh, you know presented to the public uh, in an effort to confuse things and uh, uh, possibly to be able to get those uh, funds out of Social Security and put them in the uh, private sector, worst of all in the stock market. 
Social Security indeed right now, in, as of the uh, last uh, trustees report, has about $2.6 trillion in its funds. That's projected to write, uh, go up by 2023, almost double to $4.3 trillion. It is true that those funds will, you know, those accrued funds will be exhausted paying benefits by the year 2036. But that doesn't by any means signify that Social Security is going to go bankrupt at that time. We're going to run out of money. And the reason I say that is because there will still be about 171 million people that work every day, that pay into Social Security, uh, FICA taxes every day, that, every time that they work. Uh, so worst case scenario, Social Security in 2036 will still be able to pay well over three quarters of its obligations. Uh, of course, that's to be understood without making any sort of adjustments between now and 2036. We have 24 or some odd years to uh, make the necessary adjustments between now and 2036. So it's not like uh, it's in an immediate crisis. There are changes, modest adjustments that can be made uh, in order to uh, guarantee the 100% of the benefits. But by no stretch is it going bankrupt, is it going broken, as we say, as we hear in the media. Thanks, Roy. Uh, Wilhelmina, Roy just uh, said, by no stretch of the imagination is the program going bankrupt, but there are changes that should be made in order to ensure that it remains adequate and solvent in the future. We keep hearing in the media recommendations such as raising the retirement age or cutting the cost of living adjustment or going to private individual accounts that are, uh, that are managed by Wall Street. What would these popular, and when I say popular, this is what we keep hearing in the media, uh, what do these recommendations actually mean for communities of color? Well, clearly, if you raise the age at which you can get full benefits or even raise the age at which you can get early retirement benefits, that's going to affect groups such as African Americans who have shorter life expectancies. They will pay into the system for many, many years and not live to get benefits. But it affects everybody because when you raise the retirement age, you start paying benefits for the average person later, which, which is a way of cutting benefits over the long run. And that could re result in as much as a 13% benefit cut for people over time. Now that's one of the commonly discussed ways of trying to make the system solvent. A second commonly discussed means of restoring solvency to the system would be to alter the uh, price index that cost of living adjustments are calculated by. And there's some talk of using the chain chained CPI rather than the current form of the uh, CPI to calculate COLAs. That would have a similar effect. Over time, it would result in cost in, in cutting benefits. And for people who are living longer, uh, for those groups who have longer life expectancies, uh, cutting benefits as they get older, meaning benefit checks getting smaller as they get older, is truly a non-starter because the, the longer most of us live, the greater our expenses are, mainly in part because of health care expenses. Privatizing the system, I'm not quite sure why people still talk about that. I think having lived through the recent subprime market collapse and the Great Depression and seeing the volatile nature of stock yield and seeing how people who did X at a certain point in time lost their shirt. Um, I don't see how people can still talk about that, um, but it is viewed as a way to get government out of a program that I certainly think government needs to be in because this is a form of social insurance and there's no private sector entity that is going to give us that. So these are three of the popular ways that we hear discussed about 
how we can make the system more sovereign, but they're not really looking at how you can make the benefits more adequate or meet the needs of the beneficiaries in a better way. Well, I mean, I think you raise a, a good point. They don't talk about how do we actually strengthen Social Security benefits. But before I actually turn to your colleague to probe that, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if these recommendations are so bad for communities of color and certainly low-income populations and, uh, and, and others out there, uh, people who work in hard labor jobs, why are they still uh, touted as the way to address Social Security? I think one of the main reasons is the people who are most affected by these types of mm -hmm. means to make the system solvent, meaning raising the retirement age, cutting the COLA, privatizing, et cetera, the people who are most affected by it are the ones who are sort of out of sight and out of mind. They are not the people that are thought about when members of Congress, say, are focusing on how to make the system solvent. That's one main, main reason. Um, a right. second reason is the system seems to be sort of complicated. And I think some people are banking on the fact that people just won't focus on what's being done within the system. A little tinkering here, a little tinkering there, and because it's so complex, people won't notice, and they can do things such as was done in 1983 when the um, retirement age was in, increased, and it's affecting all of us who are on this phone call when, when we reach the age to draw benefits. But I think there's also a possible third reason, especially with the argument about privatizing the system. I mean, they're clearly our private sector entities that will benefit hugely from establishing a private version, you know, any way you want to de define it, of the Social Security system. Yep. Thank you, Wilhelmina. Uh, Roy, uh, Wilhelmina just mentioned that um, nobody's talking about how do we actually strengthen the program. We talked about the impact of the recession and the housing crisis. We talked about, you know, the destabilization of the labor market, higher unemployment rates, certainly among communities of color. Uh, what are specific options that we should consider for strengthening the Social Security program? I think one of the most important ones is to increase the uh, wage base on which uh, taxes are, are charged, you know, tax contributions for Social Security are made, FICA. Today it is 110100 a year. Once a person earns more than that amount, they no longer pay uh, any FICA taxes into Social Security, a very regressive tax. Uh, typically, when the program has been strong and been able to function the way it's supposed to, 90% of the wages of the earnings in our society have been taxed for Social Security. Today we see that only 80% are taxed for Social Security purposes, and that is owing to the reason that, you know, to the fact that uh, people of higher earnings do not pay after they reach that threshold. So removing that threshold certainly would go a long, excuse me, would go a long ways into uh, uh, solving any challenges that we might that we might encounter in 2036 or going forth. Uh, Another thing that has been considered and also would contribute substantially to uh, providing adequate funds is allowing or including uh, people from other government entities, from government entities to pay into Social Security. Today, federal government employees do pay, but a lot of counties, a lot of states, a lot of teachers groups do not pay into Social Security. So including them in the, in the mix would certainly help. Any combination, perhaps the uh, uh, eliminating the ceiling plus including all of these other uh, uh, government employees would solve most of our problem. So scrap the cap and bringing in all state and local workers would actually close the long-term solvency gap and uh, enable us to pay full Social Security benefits for another 75 years. Correct. Uh, However, Meiju, um, I think what Roy just did was answer the question of how do we actually pay for addressing the solvency gap. 
but also how do we actually pay for it? It would also encompass paying for making benefits stronger. What are some of the proposals for increasing the adequacy and access of Social Security benefits? Yes, you know, Roy mentioned a few things that are very simple fixes of making the uh, payroll tax even more universal, which is what social insurance is supposed to be all about. But we shouldn't start, as uh, many do in our Congress right now, to start with the shortfalls. We should start with what is it that people that what is it that people need? Because the point of Social Security is that people who work hard and contribute their labor and lives to building this economy shouldn't die in poverty um, for reasons outside of their control. So some of the things that we think need to be strengthened, and by the way, the Commission to Modernize Social Security included people from all of the communities of color, and they agreed on these recommendations. First, we're concerned for those who are very old, and we need to increase the benefit to those 85 and older. Uh, that particularly helps um, Asians and Latinos who are the most likely to live to those ages. However, of course, it means um, everybody who is very old would um, get get a uh, greater benefit. We're very concerned for women who still are the poorest in our society, poorer than men. Elderly women are the poorest. Uh, one is that we can give women five years of dependent care credit. So in other words, you need to have at least 40 quarters in order to qualify for Social Security. Many women, particularly Latina women, um, who are the most likely to be mothers, and it might be because of the younger demographic, um, but to allow five years of dependent care credit would help a whole lot. Um, and we women all know that um, taking care of children or, or sick family members is certainly work. We also need to change the benefit for widowed spouses. Right now, a low-income woman who is married to a low-income husband has to choose at his death her own benefit or his. And that could be lower than the benefit received by a, a wife of a higher income earning man who has never worked herself. That's a clear, clearly um, unfair uh, 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 way of, of uh, providing benefits. There are other benefit increases that we need as well to take account of the fact that people have lost both wealth and jobs during this recession. Um, one is to simply increase the special minimum benefit for those who've worked over 30 years um, and who still, when they receive Social Security, are only at 100% of poverty. We'd like that to be increased to 125% of poverty. We want to increase all benefits by a uniform amount. Um, and lastly, to restore the benefit for children of deceased or disabled workers to the age of 22 if they are pursuing post-secondary education. That was a benefit until 1981, I believe it was, um, and that needs to be restored. We're talking a lot about the importance of education for children, and children of color are more likely to be greatly in debt uh, because of um, pursuing higher education. So those are all things that we uh, have suggested to strengthen Social Security, and our uh, proposals for raising revenues would cover all of those things. Thank you, Meiju. Um, as we actually wrap up our discussion with the panelists, I would like to invite uh, the audience, uh, the listening audience, to uh, type your questions into the box on your screen. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to turn to Dave. Dave, uh, we've just heard uh, both Roy and Meiju talk about a progressive agenda for Social Security reform. This is not cutting benefits. This is actually raising enough money to actually strengthen and improve benefits and also um, make sure that Social Security is solvent in the long term. What do you think uh, should in individuals and groups should do to advance a progressive like this, uh, progressive agenda for Social Security reform? I believe that we as advocates face a huge challenge here. When we talk about the Social Security dialogue or the debate, it's very much loaded on one side. We too often think that if we go out to our communities of color and explain and gain understanding by them that we may have succeeded. But that's truly only half the story. We somehow are responsible for carrying their voices back to the government and the decision makers. And I don't think we've generally done a good job of that. In a very recent project, uh, Roy uh, participated with me. We're we're excited to tell you that uh, with a, 
a project for the National Academy of Social Insurance, Roy and I this year visited 17 senior meal sites at the Pueblos across New Mexico. We visited with elders there about their fears, their thoughts, their concerns uh, about social security. And as with many other ethnic populations, they tend to be very powerless in the political debate. Uh, if we were to have taken their concerns to their tribal council, it probably would have not gone anywhere, but we changed the process. We instead interviewed 450 elders. We received more than 500 comments and recommendations from them and condensed these into a resolution to reflect what they were saying and wanted to say to Washington. We then took it to their statewide nonprofit organization, the New Mexico Indian Council on Aging, and got a unanimous endorsement. We leveraged that and presented that resolution to the Pueblo governors, the tribal leaders in New Mexico. Nineteen of them enthusiastically endorsed what their elders had said. We now take that message to the National Congress of American Indians and if we're fortunate enough to succeed, we will have leveraged the voice of a handful of southwestern Indian elders into the national voice of 550-something tribes. We're very excited and think that if advocates can just be creative, think outside the box, leverage the voices that you have, that we can bring much more to bear in the national debate. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And, and when you talk about the national debate, let's be clear. I mean, we've got elections coming up in November. We're talking about the policy-making process, right? So I'd like to pose to anyone who'd like to ask but there have also been proposals from them to cut the cost of living adjustment benefits, for example. Um, so those are things that will certainly come back if we have um, that, those, those groups uh, more in power. But I did want to say in terms of policymakers too, the plan for a new future was disseminated to Congress people and at the, um, we, we found out that Representative Gwen Moore from Wisconsin is introducing a bill that includes increases in benefits, which is amazing, you know, because since all of the talk has been about cutting it, and has adopted a number of our recommendations, um, both for improving benefits and for how we might pay for them. So I would suggest, too, that people watch that and um, to be ready to uh, put in your support or your organization's support for those kinds of changes and let your Congress people know. Um, so, so that would be that would be one action step. One thing Thank you. that I th oh, I'm sorry. One thing no, that ahead. I think that we might need to be wary about is steps that people may want to take to cannibalize or tap into the Social Security trust funds, even though they're supposed to be separate and uh, there are guarantees that the federal government will pay back the cut in the payroll tax that was earmarked for them. Um, I think we, we need to keep our eyes open and our ears open to see what happens. And I'm afraid that it doesn't matter too much who actually gets into office, whether this risk um, actually materializes. Because I think we're in such a shaky situation in terms of our deficit that people are sort of, you know, grasping for straws. And I could see that the social security system might be in some danger from actions that are ill-conceived and probably illegal. But I wouldn't be surprised to see some people trying them. And I'm not sure it has anything to do with which person becomes president this fall. 
So actually, uh, Wilhelmina, you actually asked the question uh, that uh, of, you mentioned the payroll tax. Uh, many people are aware that the Democrats have been pushing for a payroll tax holiday. I'm not sure that everybody listening to today's webinar understands how the payroll tax is actually connected to Social Security and why a payroll tax holiday, uh, how a payroll tax holiday might affect Social Security. Okay, well then let me give a little background on that. Um, in recent years, Social Security has been funded in large part because 6.2% of the wages of workers are taken as taxes and the employer pays a matching 6.2% of the wages of each worker. So that 12.4% total is what in, in large measure pays for the benefits of each person who is currently getting benefits from the Social Security system. Now, over the more, the more recent past, we've had cuts in the amount that the payroll tax was. Uh, two percentage points were lopped off, and all workers are now having 4.2% taken out of their paychecks and employers are paying a matching 4.2% with the promise that the federal government will make good on that amount to keep the Social Security system solvent, meaning the federal government out of general revenues will make up that difference so the system is solvent and people can continue paying benefits. Now the logic behind doing this was to lower costs for employers to encourage them to expand their businesses, hire more, more people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's the reason that we see smaller FICA tax taken out of our checks. Um, the risk that I see there, though, is how is it paid back? And when is it paid back? And do we reach a point where, where we say the Social Security system has done fine uh, with just taking 4.2% out of workers' paychecks. Uh, so we really don't need to make that up. You know, that, that's the, the thing that I worry about. Um, but there is plenty of support for stimulating the economic system, and I don't naysay this as, as a method, but I think that it needs to be strictly term limited. I mean, it needs to be for a certain period of time, and then we have to go back to, to the way things were, or else I think we're harming the long-term uh, viability of the Social Security system. Perhaps um, just you. to add to that, Wilhelmina, um, you know, perhaps what we could do is to um, suggest that another way of approaching this is we know that we want more money put into the pockets of low-wage workers because they will spend it and thus stimulate the economy. But instead of the 2% payroll tax, we should replace that with a 2% cut on all income taxes for workers who are making below $110,000, which is the cutoff point for uh, the payroll tax. That would be another way of doing it. In terms of advocacy, I think we need to remind our constituents that the payroll tax is not like the income tax or other taxes. It's more like an insurance premium. You pay into it and you get a benefit, um, and you um, don't get a benefit if you don't pay in. It's like if you buy a, a car insurance, if your car gets in a crash, you're going to collect on it. Um, so people have to understand that difference, particularly younger workers and younger people in our communities who are paying in now, and they have every right to expect uh, that they will also get a benefit when, when they need it. <clears throat> Major, you just mentioned something uh, with regards to uh, an alternative stimulus. But I'd like to ask uh, our panelists, isn't, uh, isn't Social Security itself an economic stabilizer? Doesn't it have a stimulative effect on the economy? Absolutely. <laughs> I think especially, especially for people in our communities of color, seeing how little income they have besides Social Security income and how little that is, it's like every penny that they get, they will use and spend in the economy and, and that will circulate widely. This is Roy over here. Could I, could I respond to that? 
Please do. Okay. Uh, oops, I, I lost my train of thought here. <laughs> I, I was asking about Social Security program as an economic stimulus for the nation. Oh, yes. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Uh, it has been indeed told to us by several sources that uh, had it not been for Social Security benefits going back into the economy at the rate of around $600 billion, that uh, we would have gone into a great depression all over again like we did in the late 20s, early 30s. So yes, it does have a stimulus effect on the economy. And I'd like, also like to point out that um, people spend the money locally, so it's great for local businesses and um, you know, for a local community, for a city or town, for a rural area, it's really a critical uh, uh, piece of um, the economy. We would like the, uh, the audience to please submit any questions that you have by typing it into the box on your screen. Uh, before I turn to the next, I'd like to ask another question. We've got Occupy Wall Street uh, talking about the 99% versus the 1%. Uh, we do know that over the last uh, three to four decades that wages in America have stagnated, and we also know that uh, income has really accumulated to the 1% at the top, uh, while the wages for the rest of America have basically remained uh, in place. Uh, what actually has this growing wage inequality and wage stagnation meant for the Social Security program? How does it how does it impact Social Security? Well, what it means is there is more income at the top that doesn't get taxed, meaning there are more people who earn more than one hundred and six thousand eight hundred in a year. And if you earn more than 106800 in a year, all of your earnings above that threshold don't get taxed. And it means that more of the Social Security FICA tax revenue is coming from lower wage workers because they are the ones whose uh, earnings will probably never reach what the threshold currently is. So it's made the system, the system is now being supported more by lower wage earners and less by higher wage earners. So earlier Roy, Roy suggested that one of the solutions to the long-term solvency issues of Social Security is actually scrapping the cap, taking that $110,100 cap and, and eliminating it so that high, high wage earners would continue to pay on Social Security. Um, yet there are people who would push back against that. Uh, can you explain why the scrap cap movement is viable in the context of what Wilhelmina just described? Roy, I cut you off. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's a, not a popular idea among those, that, of course, that earn that kind of money. Uh, those are the very same groups of people that are intent on uh, doing away with the Social Security programs, reducing them to the extent possible. And so, of course, that's a big hurdle that we would have to overcome is to, uh, if not gain acceptance to it, certainly overcome those hurdles some way. Well, one of the ways to possibly overcome hurdles is tax everyone's earnings to the fullest and still give high wage earners benefits more you know benefits more than they would have have gotten if they were just taxed on the 106,800 but do it with a much flatter formula so that they aren't getting double you know let's say they make um, 212,000 each, each year instead of the 106. Um, change the formula so they're not getting double what they would have gotten if they were, if their taxation stopped at the 106,000 level. Uh, you know, give them some, something more, but not as much more as that income would be counted for lower wage earners, if that makes sense. But that's okay. one possible way to uh, soften the, the blow of scrapping the cap. 
you know, make it possible for the higher wage earners who are still paying taxes to get something more back. And that's the way the recommendation was framed in the report of the Commission to Modernize Social Security. Well, it really would be an economic blow in terms of what they are going to get. Those are the people that are much more likely to have savings. They, they have strong legs. Uh, the They have a strong two legs of the three-legged stool and do not rely, rely on Social Security. However, keeping it universal is just a principle that we should stick to. It's one of the reasons why Social Security has had such strong support over 77 years. And so certainly to have even very wealthy people uh, get some benefit is a way to um, make, the, make the program even more universal. So I think our, our commission thought that that was right. But you know, President Obama stated his support, I believe, for the Warren Buffett rule. <laughs> and um, so right now, for those that make a million dollars, they pay less than 1% of an effective tax payroll tax rate. And that's certainly not their fair share. Well, I want to thank all of the panelists and Maya for moderating the panel. This has been a very informative, uh, great discussion on Social Security. We're going to take a few minutes to an uh, answer some questions that the audience has submitted. Um, first, a clarification question on the payroll tax. Uh, someone asks, I believe employers are continuing to pay 6.2%. Am I not correct? I don't think so. I right. think that em I think That's correct. This is, this is Roy. It is correct that they're continuing to pay 6.2. Now, if the extension for a year goes through, among the recommendations in that extension is indeed the idea of cutting that 2% also for the employers. But right now, it is only for the workers that that 2% reduction is effective. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question. Um, you mentioned GOP proposals. But the Obama, Obama administration appointed Wall Street Democrats to things like the debt panel last year and the payroll tax holiday as well. What do you expect from the Democrats this year on, the, on this issue in the campaign? What should progressives be doing? Hmm. Well, I think um, the Democrats um, under the leadership of President Obama have moved to the center under pressure from the right, the Tea Party, and so on. But I think one thing that is encouraging to those of us who are on the progressive side of things is that the Occupy Wall Street, the mood of the country has shifted. Um, and people are not just looking at cut, cut, cut. They can't afford themselves to take cuts any longer. Even middle and higher middle class people are feeling um, the pinch. So I think that the important thing now, and I think we saw a much feistier President Obama in his uh, State of the Union, uh, perhaps buoyed up, up by some of that uh, pressure from, more from the, the left side of the aisle. And I think that we all need to raise our voices even more, particularly on this issue of Social Security. It's some, going to be something that is so important to the future. And as we say, it's not hard at all to fix. It would be a great victory um, if we could expand the benefits. Great. Thank you. Another question here. What does the Ryan budget do to Social Security? Since all the candidates running in the Republican primary are supporting that budget, what should we ask them to clarify in terms of the impact of these policies? Maya, do you? Actually, I, I focus on the Ryan budget in terms of what it did to um, Medicare. Um, I'm actually not up on what the proposal did in terms of Social Security. The question um, actually asked, asked about Medicare as well. Oh, well, what, what's the part that asks about Medicare? Uh, what does the Ryan budget do to Social Security and Medicare, if you can address that? Oh, okay. Well, basically, it eliminates uh, Medicare as we know it. Um, by turning it into a voucher program uh, that would give uh, uh, seniors a, a fixed amount and, and telling them to go out and purchase uh, an insurance plan with that fixed amount. And, and that essentially destroys the essence of Medicare as we know it, uh, and it undermines the health security and certainly the economic security of senior citizens. As you well know, health care is very expensive. 
and the voucher that the Ryan budget actually proposed, the value of it, wouldn't be significant enough to take care of the health care needs of an aging population with many multiple uh, chronic diseases and other very expensive health service needs. And so what we have is an agenda uh, that Ryan, Paul Ryan presents that undermines social insurance, uh, that undermines certainly the economic security and the health security of senior citizens in our nation, and certainly deserves to be um, excoriated for, for that uh, intent. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question, uh, and it's just a clarif I, I believe it's a cor clarification question. What were the figures given for uh, Social Security contribution to the economy and preventing us from entering another depression? That was Roy. Roy, could you repeat million. that? Yeah, that was $600 million that goes back in in the form of uh, Social Security benefits that are spent back into the economy. B as in billion or M as in million? B as in boy, billion. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you all uh, for attending today. I have a, a couple of announcements. You can see the contact information uh, on your screen. Um, you can also access this presentation and the slides later today at http www.insightcced.org backslash ssresources.html. It's the same link that you saw earlier in the presentation. Uh, we also just posted an updated um, version of the Plan for the New Future report. Um, so if you downloaded that early in the presentation, please download the latest copy uh, by going back to that link I just mentioned. Um, and we thank you for your time. And please check out the resources page when you have a chance. Thank you. Thank you.